Uh, hello and welcome this morning. Thanks all for coming. Uh, I'm assuming I'm meant to just kick off and there's no one else before me, so we'll, we'll work on that premise. Um, can I just thank you all for coming this morning? Um, my name's Chris Clark. I'm the Deputy DG at uh, JETSI for responsible for resources and project facilitation. And it's my pleasure to facilitate this morning's session. Uh, before we start, can I just acknowledge this event is being held on, tradi on the tra traditional lands of the Noongar people? And also, can I just cover a couple of housekeeping items? Uh, for those that may need them, the toilets are located outside the theatre at the back of the exhibition hall. In the unlikely event of an emergency, alarms will activate. An initial alarm going beep, beep, beep will be uh, indicating please prepare to evacuate. And then if a second alarm happens with a whoop, whoop, whoop sound, uh, please evacuate and proceed to the assembly point. Um, all the staff at the convention centre here will, will direct you in that regard, and they'll all be wearing red hats. But hopefully nothing will happen in that regard. Um, can you please put your mobile phones on silent, if you wouldn't mind, just out, out of courtesy. Um, but feel free to post on the social media using the uh, hashtag uh, AOG40. Um, can I just acknowledge the uh, sponsors of today's session? Um, this particular session is sponsored by my department, or the department I work for, JETSI. And can I also thank the forum partners, Woodside Energy, Chevron Australia, JETSI, as I've said, uh, NERA, and Deloitte. Um, just before we get to the speakers, I thought it might be useful if I just quickly go through what the state government's uh, plans and strategies are for renewable hydrogen. Uh, the state launched its strategy um, back in 2019, and it aims to harness WA's competitive advantages, including our world-class energy resources, our vast land mass, and our proud history as an exporting, uh, exporter of energy to international markets. The vision is pretty simple. It's, to make, it's for WA to become a significant producer, exporter, and user of renewable hydrogen. The strategy has four uh, focus areas. Again, they won't come as any surprise, but the first one is to do with remote applications and involves you know, re reducing the reliance of diesel in remote industries and communities, and we're already seeing that um, as, a, as a real opportunity. The next um, key area is around blending of hydrogen into our natural gas networks, and again, that's an area that we're working hard on and see some real potential. The third area is around transportation, particularly in regional areas and freight. And the final area, and I guess the ultimate goal that we're um, all aspiring to is towards export and leveraging our renewable energy resources and experience in exporting other forms of energy to meet the growing world demand. JETSI is responsible, as I said, for delivering this initiative and has put uh, a roadmap out of activities that will support the development of this and enable us to realise this vision, hopefully. It's very clear, and I guess very topical for today, that we will need to work really closely with the industry, which we're trying to do, to achieve the targets that have been set for 2022 and 2030. And I mean, the ones for 2030 are quite ambitious. They've been brought forward from the original uh, plan that was set. So we definitely need to work closely with the industry, and I think uh, that's happening well. Uh, I look forward to hear from our five presenters now. They all look like really interesting topics and I'm sure you will enjoy them this morning. Um, our first presentation is, um, is from Jeff Ward, and he will discuss Hazer Group, WA's emerging clean energy producer. Jeff is the Chief Executive Officer of Hazer Group, which is a very innovative company, and I'd like to welcome Jeff to the stage. Cool, um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, firstly, so thank you, and um, it's a pleasure to actually stand here. I heard on the radio this morning it was one year today since the World Health Organisation declared the pandemic, and having sort of financed projects, developed this technology, worked with ARENA and governments, um, it's actually quite strange to not be staring at a Zoom screen um, 
at home in Brisbane. So thank you very much to Jetsy for the opportunity to speak today um, and for the invitation and for all the work that they do supporting WA's hydrogen strategy. Um, and also I'd like to acknowledge uh, NERA and the recent work on uh, the successful hydrogen clusters program of which you know, the Peel and South West Metropolitan Perth was one of the winners and one that which we're really proud to be part of and collaborate with. Um, so today I'd like to talk about Hazer. Um, it's a very West Australian story. It was a technology born at the University of Western Australia. Um, we're now building the first scaled up, fully integrated example of the process in the Hazer demonstration plant in collaboration with the Water Corporation here in WA. But also I think it's an example of the diversity um, which was partly reflected in Chris's remarks of how much uh, the hydrogen uh, industry is growing up, is transforming, transforming um, and becoming a lot uh, more sort of diverse and sophisticated than we might have understood two or three years ago. So I'm sure you know, as the presentations progress, um, you know, Luke Blackburn from Yara and Rob from FMG will talk about the very large scale aspirations um, and projects. Um, but I'd like to talk about an innovation company, a startup, and where we're going with a new technology. Um, so just to briefly, what is the Hazer process? Yeah, we're a, a low cost, low emission process to make two you know, high value and we hope high demand products. So we simply take um, a hydrocarbon feedstock, methane preferably, methane, ethane, LNG, um, and we using iron ore, yeah, another very w topically Western Australian product as a low cost catalyst, produce hydrogen and graphite from it. So rather than typical gas-based hydrogen production processes that produce CO2 as a byproduct, we produce graphite, a solid, capturable, storable and usable product. And we think this is actually an intriguing prospect for the 21st century because they're two products that we think have really strong market dynamics. Enormous, uh, obviously, push for hydrogen, but also an incredible push to actually use more modern materials, whether that's in lithium-ion battery materials, whether that's in conductive films for microelectronics, yeah, micro whether that's in new forms of carbon-to-carbon -carbon battery, whether that's in the increased use of electrodes as we move towards green steel, or whether that's actually just in high-strength you know, composites and the more and more availability of carbon, which is one of the key decarbonisation decarbonisation themes. As we decarbonise, we will inevitably have more carbon we have to deal with and the opportunities that arises. So we think it's a technology that plays into both those themes. Um, we're a clean and cost-effective technology and when paired with renewable biogas, um, as the project we're doing here in Western Australia, we, then, we have the lowest emissions profile of any available technology going actually beyond you know, where solar and electrolysis can reach and taking you know, methane originating from waste out of the atmosphere and capturing all the carbon associated with the feedstock. Um, so in a simple diagram, yeah, what's our process? Yeah, we start off with methane, which is 25% approximately hydrogen by mass, 75% carbon. We react that in a fluidised bed reactor, you know, similar reactor types that are used commonly in refining, mineral sands, many other large process technologies. We use a powdered iron ore as a catalyst. Um, in fact, we can use high quality Pilbara iron ore directly as is. Um, we're currently using a whole lot of catalysts from Kulia Nobbing through our collaboration with Mineral Resources. Um, but you know, Nickelback or uh, Whaleback or West Angeles would also work equally well. And we produce hydrogen as a gas and graphite as a solid. And I'll talk a little bit more about the graphite in a moment. So where's our technology? Our technology started at the University of Western Australia. Um, the company founder and my colleague Andrew Cornegio actually did his PhD on the topic and then the technology went through that sort of you know, pathway that universities and governments were always aspiring to of moving from research uh, into pre-commercial company into a seed capital funded company, the desktop research. And now five years later, we're actually building the first larger scale operation. The Hazer Commercial Demonstration Plant is a 100 tonne per annum fuel cell grade hydrogen production facility that will also produce about 375 tonnes per annum of graphite. We're working with biogas as our feedstock, a renewable methane produced through the digestion of solids in the, waste, uh, in the treatment of wastewater. So there's typically you know, three big sources of, um, of biogas. You could cluster them. You know, one is wastewater treatment plants. You know, almost any city over a million people will have one or more large-scale wastewater treatment plants that digest the solids, um, you know, the residual solids from their waste, into biogas. The other one is landfill, large landfills. You know, there's two or three large consolidated landfill sites on the outskirts of most uh, big industrial um, cities, big modern cities. You know, that's another big source of biogas. And the third is agricultural, farm and food processing waste. 
And this is, sort of, we think, a, a really underutilised area. You know, historically, it's been burnt for power, but as renewables become cheaper, that business model becomes less attractive and the emissions associated with it become less attractive. So we see the, um, the path from biogas to hydrogen, and in our case, solid graphite rather than CO2, as a really strong future market. The collaboration with the Water Corporation, I think, you know, shows how this kind of local, bio, local biogas to hydrogen and local production of energy from waste is a really um, a strong fit with our customers, the customers at the um, waste end as well as the customers at the transport or hydrogen fuel end. You know, we will deliver significant CO2 emissions to their ongoing facility at Woodman Point and we also offer them a path for how that they can continue to increase the amount of their waste that they utilise as resource and offering um, a starting point for sort of um, local industry, whether that's uh, hydrogen for clean transport hubs, whether it's graphite for high, um, high value manufacturing. Um, and while we're sort of, while I'm back here in Perth, I'll make a plug for another West Australian company and just acknowledge that we're uh, working with Primero Group as our engineering partner on this. Uh, we have a very strong international uh, relationship and partnership with Chioda from Japan, who are helping us with larger scale developments. Um, but for the first project that's type, we're working closely with Primero as well as um, other Perth-based resources, um, who are our engineering um, contractor. Um, so a quick snapshot of what the process looks like. Um, we're currently just getting to the end of detailed design and procurement. Um, we've completed all permitting on site. Um, and as we have told the market, we expect to break ground with the civil site preparation uh, in first quarter this year. Uh, we're targeting a start-up fourth quarter this year, um, around about a November commissioning time, October, November, November, December. And so hopefully by the end of the year, and when we have this conference again next year, we'll be up and producing hydrogen and graphite for a first of its kind continuous operation of this new technology. Um, and sort of maybe in a departure yeah, from what we're often talking about here, hydrogen, I do actually want to talk about graphite. Um, because one of the themes today was I noticed that the, the title was Hydrogen is about an emerging industry. And of course, you know, hydrogen, clean transport, low emission industries um, are actually about a big transition, a transition to new jobs. You know, what's going to replace the large employers um, of the natural gas world um, and the oil world you know, in 20, 30 and 40 years time? Because I think if one thing you know, we've learnt last year, other than you know, various forms of quarantine and isolation aren't always fun, um, is that there has been a massive acceleration of a really deep transition. And if we look at the level of commitment, you know, particularly outside Australia, in Europe, um, in Asia, um, and now in the US with the change of government, we're seeing a really deep and heartfelt move. And, and that's being reflected, I think, in you know, things like the formation of Fortescue Future Industries you know, and the large scale push to take these projects you know, into the early stages of development. What a, one of the things that appealed to me about the innovation uh, capable you know, from a company like Hazer was the actual Hazer Graphite. Um, it's a unique, um, highly crystalline graphite. It's a synthetic form of graphite, but it has different characteristics to the typical synthetic graphites, which typically are produced um, by uh, the, the treatment and processing of very, very heavy oil residues, you know, an intensive use of thermal baking, um, and also the high use of hydrofluoric acid. So it's an industry which produces an incredibly um, technically specific, detailed, high-value product you know, through a collection of really horrible, messy chemical processes. Now, we see in the Hazer Graphite the opportunity to actually open up a new pathway for high-value materials manufacture. They'll be able to source graphite from sustainable sources, biogas, landfill gas, you know, or natural gas, you know, with the carbon being captured. It's a way of actually reducing the environmental footprint um, of graphite products, something that's becoming incredibly important for you know, producers and consumers like Apple, Samsung, and, and everybody who's focusing on the um, sustainability of their supply chains. And actually, our material has a set of characteristics which are slightly different from all other graphites because it's formed in a slightly different way. You know, one thing I've learned is that you know, the graphite industry is about how it looks at the, literally at the compound, at the micron level, rather than how it performs at the bulk level. Um, and so there's actually, you know, if we seize the opportunity, the potential to take our knowledge about this product to create really interesting manufacturing hubs or really interesting innovations to create graphite products which are unique and have unique selling points. Um, and so I think that that's a, you know, another pathway as we keep following what this transition means is that it actually means new jobs and opportunities, you know, not just in the bulk supply of energy. Um, 
Building on that, then, I would like to sort of actually flag and acknowledge um, how important R&D is to Hazer. Um, so our company started as a research and development company. You know, it's got innovation that's founded in R&D. Um, we have uh, participate both through the CRC, the Cooperative Research Centre Program. Um, we started with the technology in the University of Western Australia and now have a partnership with the University of Sydney. And our R&D will continue on two pathways. You know, one is around catalyst and reaction development. So taking all of the science uh, that we've developed, a lot of it out of the oil and gas and chemical processing industry, but actually continuing to refine how our catalyst performs, what makes it a good performer, what makes the reaction uh, energy efficient, what makes the reaction yield efficient. But the other area is actually about graphite and characterising you know, its functions, its applications, how do we test and, and classify it, but also how do we purify it. And we're really excited about some emerging R&D, and I'll stress that this is R&D, which means that its results are uncertain and the timelines can be long. Um, but we've had some really promising early results about how we can purify our graphite from the approximately 90% that we produce it at directly out of the process, and of which we do see uses as is out of the reactor, to 99.5 or higher, which opens up uses in incredibly high value applications. And because of the unique way that we form the graphite, because of its unique chemical um, and morphological characteristics, um, we think that we can reform, refine this graphite without using heat or acid, which would actually create a completely you know, uh, niche, uh, but we think very high value class of graphite products. Um, so I'll wrap up uh, there in a moment. Um, this is obviously a slide most people have seen before. It's from the, uh, the World Hydrogen Council. Uh, it goes back a year or two, but I think it's actually um, a really neat summation of why so much is being spoken about hydrogen in so many different ways, and why it's being spoken about in contexts like the oil and gas world, like the renewables world, like the transport and manufacturing world, is that um, hydrogen plays you know, a a large number of roles in different places, you know, from energy storage and transport, um, from grid integration and stability, to being used as a product in transport, to decarbonising heavy industry, to supporting civic infrastructure. Um, and I'd just sort of like to sort of leave as a sort of maybe a thought that others can build on is that you'll hear today about actually a whole wide range of ways that hydrogen can be used. I think it's absolutely clear that there has been a shift in the last one to two years from taking on this role three years ago and having the very first discussions with investment banks and fund managers about why hydrogen was an investment thematic and, and what it would mean to you know, Bank of America, uh, Citigroup just recently put out research last week you know, talking about the potential for trillion dollar um, investments over 30 years um, and um, you know, in a trillion dollar market by sort of the mid-century. And I think we're seeing that through the, you know, the rise of national programs, you know, such as the collaboration between Australia and Germany to investigate you know, an Australia and Germany supply chain, such as the collaboration we've had with the Japanese government um, at a G to G level, um, but also you know, the, you know, the wave of national investment plans which are now moving from strategies uh, into funded plans. Um, what I will say is that the, we're seeing an incredible interest in our technology from an incredibly diverse range of users. Um, and whether it's decarbonising gas grids um, or power grids, uh, whether it's uh, decarbonising steel, whether it's integrating with the manufacture of ammonia and chemicals, or whether it's, you know, as we're doing here in Western Australia, um, an example of local economy, use of renewable feedstocks to do local manufacturing of fuel uh, close to where it's used. Um, the hydrogen market is going to become an increasingly diverse one. Yeah. It's not going to be one size fits all. And the range of opportunities are going to span sort of projects and energy production to local manufacturing, local supply and local services. Um, and I hope that we stay open to all of those. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to Jetsy for the opportunity to speak. Um, and I look forward to uh, the rest of the day. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Jeff. I mean, uh, obviously, Jeff is a huge en enthusiast for the work they're doing, and you can understand why. It's great to see, I guess, local talent and research done in WA being commercialised, and I guess that's the beauty of uh, the CRCs, which the state has been, you know, really successful in the last few years in securing for WA. So that's uh, it's a really good story, and we all hope to see that develop into the future. Our next speaker um, is 
Luke Blackburn, who will be presenting on large-scale Pilbara renewables, a roadmap. Uh, Jetsy's worked quite closely with Yarra Pilbara on this, um, their ambitions to utilise renewable hydrogen in their facility at, um, on the borough. And um, we really hope to get that project up and hope it's only the beginning of something much bigger. So, Luke, welcome. Thanks, thanks very much, Chris, and, and thanks, Jeff, for probably what is a really good segue into what I'll be talking about. So, excellent. Uh, let me also acknowledge that we're meeting today on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pay our respects to uh, Elders past, present and emerging. Also acknowledge we've got here today the, uh, His Excellency Paul Larson, the Norwegian Ambassador to Australia, and also Rob Lynn, the Consul to Perth, Western Australia. Um, so, referencing the, uh, the, the fact we're in Noongar country, you see here, uh, Yabara country, which is where Yara Pilbara operates, one of the sites which features their magnificent rock art, which is uh, known as Najali or Deep Gorge. So we work in a pretty special part of the world. Now I've got um, 12 minutes to uh, detail how we're going to get to a new uh, export industry. So I need to skip over a bunch of things and keep it fairly brief, but it's, you know, just painting the picture. So what I'll uh, do, the key points to summarise are that we'll be looking at the natural advantage of the Pilbara region, the growing opportunity which is developing for us, as Jeff has touched on, the existing assets we possess in the region, and a draft roadmap that shows one way to a large-scale renewables development in the region. And then finally, just touch on the partnerships that I think will be really important to our success. First of all, a high level orientation, particularly for those of you from distant parts. Uh, sometimes when I'm over east, they only know of a place called the Pilbara, they don't know anything about it. But I know we're a relatively Pilbara literate audience, but it's important to orient ourselves. Um, it's about as isolated as you can get, yet it possesses significant and long standing connections to other regions. So, from the distance perspective, it's 1,250 k's from Perth to Caratha, 3,500 k's to Canberra, and only 2,800 to Singapore. So, it's closer, just as Darwin has some of this, uh, the Pilbara's closer to some of Asia's capitals than it is to our own, which gives us quite an interesting perspective. From the connectedness perspective, uh, we know how much LNG and iron ore has been uh, exported to our trading partners over the long term from the region. So, we're very much geared up for opportunities around export. Uh, one final Pilbara observation, uh, Jeff's talked about changes in the last 12 months, etc. I think uh, I've noticed particularly with interstate stakeholders that, and the Premier's mentioned this in the last couple of events I've, I've been at with him, the Pilbara has deservedly developed a kind of mythical national status in the last 12 months. It's the region that has really dragged the Australian economy along, uh, doing the economic heavy lifting whilst other areas have significantly struggled with the impacts of COVID. It's just kept going. So this is zooming in a little. The Pilbara is recognised uh, by a number of people. Professor Garneau has written about it, for instance, as possessing global export potential in a decarbonised economy. So some elements of this advantage include the land area, the vast mass that Chris has referred to also. Half a million square kilometres is available, if you like, in the region. Sometimes for overseas audiences I compare this to something they know. So the state of California is less than that, 424,000 square k's. So the Pilbara has 118% of that land space, land area. By contrast, our population is a little over 60,000 versus the California that squeezes in nearly 40 million people. So we've got about 0.001% of the population. So you can see from a large scale, large footprint development sort of um, uh, industry, we've got significant opportunities considering the, uh, the wind and solar resources. So just as importantly as I mentioned, there's the resources, there's the connectedness, the proximity, relatively speaking, to export markets. And critically now, we've, as we see today, we'll hear from Rob particularly soon and others, we've got multiple major private sector entities pursuing emissions reduction and or renewables opportunities. So given the global focus, the regional assets and the, uh, the private sector moving forward, uh, the public sector questioning how we move things forward as well, the, the Pilbara really is in a fantastic spot. Now, step through this fairly quickly. Um, we've identified some advantages of the region. Now we look at the opportunity that is developing fairly rapidly. The bottom row here represents today, if you like, and so my friends in Oslo have made it brown to signify one of the colours we attach to uh, the hydrogen we produce. We've got an existing ammonia market which supplies the fertiliser and chemical markets. It's very important. It helps ensure we feed the world, but it's relatively static. It's, it's the, the fertiliser market, if you like, and some, hydro and some chemicals. And currently the hydrogen required for this 
This is, as you see at the bottom left, um, done by an SMR process or steam methane reforming. So we're utilising natural gas solely to produce the hydrogen we need. And that has associated CO2 byproduct. So the path we're moving towards, the value we're starting to see developing fairly rapidly, is the middle line for the green uh, ammonia fertiliser hydrogen uh, developments. And as you see there, the, um, the path we're moving towards is extracting the, um, the hydrogen we need from water. And the associated power to do so is derived from the uh, from renewable sources. So you're taking the H's from the H2O using electricity instead of the old steam methane reforming process. And driving this and sitting at the top, I guess if you like, at the strategic level, is the new value chains that are being created, in part by technological advances, which in turn are partly driven by economics and by policy. So what we're moving towards is a world where, in addition to the current fertiliser markets and chemical uses, ammonia plays a role as an energy carrier and a hydrogen vector as part of this associated and a potentially huge, as Jeff said, trillion dollar green hydrogen market. So given we're talking here today about uh, the emerging industry aspects of hydrogen, that's really where the focus is and the drivers from our perspective. Just to put that into something where, my, again, my friends in Oslo have produced something uh, about this growth and what it looks like, uh, some of the numbers there in power and shipping fuel. So moving away from those relatively static markets that I've mentioned, we've gotten the opportunity for ammonia and direct power generation being explored quite significantly. So for example, the Green Ammonia Consortium in Japan is evaluating the potential for renewably generated ammonia from northwestern Australia being utilised in Japan for combustion, direct combustion and power generation. There's also the pursuit, of course, of the cracking or regasification, if you like, whereby ammonia is cracked into the, uh, the nitrogen and hydrogen elements and the renewable hydrogen itself is then fed into the Japanese power sector. For ammonia as shipping fuel, the IMOs moved quite heavily away from the traditional shipping fuels of SOX, etc. has moved rapidly. But they need to come up with scalable zero emission solutions during the next decade. So we expect publicly supported pilot projects likely to come out of the mid-2020s in Europe. And as mentioned previously, the bottom point there, uh, we've got the potential for ammonia as an energy storage or vector in a hydrogen economy. Now just zooming into the assets, so we've sort of seen the position, we've seen the opportunity. The assets we have in a, this is a place many of you will know, Murujugur or the borough. Um, it's a concentrated piece of, of significant investment and uh, I, because of the nature of the conference I haven't included the iron ore export ports that are sit basically either side of this. But what we've got here are some vital assets with major existing investment and a history of long term wealth creation for Western Australia and the nation. So you've got Woodside's Northwest Shell Venture and Pluto associated six LNG trains which are exporting gas and which is also supplying dom gas into the Dampier to Bunbury pipeline right next door. Now that pipeline is also is providing 845 terajoules into the WA market and interestingly its owners for instance AGIG are looking at a feasibility study at the moment into blending hydrogen into that pipeline. We've also got obviously Woodside's interest in hydrogen etc. We've got the marine supply base down at King Bay and at the bottom right you see the two plants that Yara has. So we've got a, an 800,000 tonne per annum ammonia plant to the left with the two storage tanks and then an associated ammonium nitrate plant to the right. So uh, we often talk about hydrogen as the full of fuel of the future, but we actually uh, make and utilise 140,000 tonnes of hydrogen a year within that ammonia plant. But as I mentioned at the front end, it's made by steam methane reforming, reforming so we have associated emissions. We're trying to move that 800,000 tonnes and 100,000 plus tonnes of hydrogen onto a greener footing. Uh, one last element, I guess, is we obviously export. You see the two sort of... Um, uh, cargo wharfs heading off from the Dampier port. We've already got existing ammonia infrastructure uh, for export, so we export from that today. The difference is the ammonia is, is created in a non-renewable way, but uh, once we start producing those green ammonia molecules and associated hydrogen, the export infrastructure is, is already there and in use. I should also mention, um, considering the company and the importance of it, from a soft infrastructure perspective, we're well and truly within the city of Carafa, and they were one of the recipients recently of uh, hydrogen tech cluster funding for the region from NERA. So again, you're starting to see all elements of government and the private sector really coming into an alignment. So, this is the heart of you know, the topic, if you like. We've considered our advantage, the opportunities and our assets. So looking at a nominal roadmap, 
um, a trajectory, if you like. Um, I'll talk initially about the first stage, which we're really on the cusp of at the moment, phase zero, and then have a quick look at phases one, two and three. I should also mention, I haven't put a hyperlink in, but the feasibility study for the um, renewables project is on the ARENA website. So this, uh, this graphic appears within the report there, which is about 44 pages. There's a lot of info. Um, so what we're looking for is here, we've got a project consisting in phase zero of a 10 megawatt electrolyzer, over 18 hectares of solar panels, integrated with the existing facility. So it's starting to put us onto a renewable feedstock. The time frames of phase zero are interesting because they're pretty short. Uh, we anticipate advice from ARENA, hopefully positive advice, in the next five or six weeks for a grant under their $70 million renewable hydrogen deployment funding round. That would allow us then to take a final investment decision to, uh, to move forward on this project in a few months. And as we show here, we could be in operations in 2023. So halfway through the term of the next government of Western Australia, we'll actually have a producing facility. Um, given the pace, which has already been mentioned, at which things are developing uh, in a global sense, we'd be seeking to run, of course, as much as possible of phase one in parallel with the, the phase zero development. There's not a hard dependency of phase one, zero into phase one, etc. And so, of course, the, um, the commercial structures and natures of the subsequent phases are flexible. They haven't been set in stone. So we can accelerate schedule and value and capture value. So phase zero is a commercial arrangement between Yara and Engie, a global player from France. Uh, whereas phases one, two and three are basically yet to be determined and we've obviously got a number of potential partners who would be developing that front end for us and we could do the deals there but it's not defined. So it's, it's a trajectory if you like but we know where we're heading on this. But what you see over the next three phases I think is critical. We're talking about in phase zero, 18 hectares of solar and a 10 megawatt electrolyzer under 1% of our current energy requirements but as soon as we go into phase, uh, phase one we've got an integrated wind and solar which will have to be elsewhere it won't be at Murujuga because of the, uh, the footprint needed, uh, the large scale. Um, the land area then is to be determined, but it might be significant. Anything from 150 to 500 megawatts of electrolyzer, and we start to get from anywhere from 6 to 20 per cent of our, our energy inputs at the existing facility coming from a renewable source. So, what you're looking at there is it's not a, a hard stop from uh, a, a carbon based product into a decarbonised product. We're transitioning across, which is critical in the energy space, in production, manufacturing, etc. Phase two uh, is, as I guess, the other key one there. We'd look, look at up to a gigawatt of electrolysis capacity there, and this is key. I guess, the potential for a new renewables-based ammonia plant. So quite a different front end. I'm no engineer, so I won't even delve into it, but it's a significantly different process of splitting water with le uh, electricity as opposed to steam methane reforming using uh, natural gas to get your hydrogen you need. So just also note, quite aggressive timelines. You know, we're potentially talking about a whole new export industry by 2030. And, uh, and so given that, um, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, but it also does uh, align uh, quite closely with some of our northern export opportunities transitioning their economies, economies to green hydrogen. So there's huge opportunity there for us to align with markets, etc. This is um, really going to micro level, but it's one of the key points which, which I wanted to make. Um, phase, it's phase zero, so you can see our existing facilities there. It highlights an important aspect of renewables development. The scale up that I just discussed will clearly require a significant land take and uh, you know, additionally services, corridors, etc., to get either renewable power or hydrogen or ammonia to an export point. So you're going to have a significant footprint. And what you see here is the um, the solar array for our phase zero takes account of those various points. So the right hand side is the heritage surveys conducted with Murujuga Aboriginal Corporation. We knew the sites were there but we've verified in the last six to eight months the sites of those heritage um, areas. They will be protected, bundled off and monitored during construction and, and therefore protected. So hence you see the odd al uh, alignment if you like of the solar panels on the left. The other reason we have a fairly large um, uh, excision, if you like, is because the, the National Heritage Place listing also impinges, so those red rocks is the National Heritage Place. So I guess there's an inherent flexibility in what we're doing footprint-wise. That means we're much more amenable to accommodating cultural needs, etc., which I'll touch on a little later. So getting towards the end, um, some short-term uh, highlights. The Western Australian Government, uh, Minister McTiernan, came up and visited us and presented us with a $2 million grant in January, which is a fantastic vote of confidence and support. The 1st of February, I mentioned the NARA funding was announced, uh, and then 30th of April, the ARENA decision. So it's been a busy Q1 of 2021, that's for sure. The other thing is, I think this is just important to capture. This again comes from Oslo. There's a lot of work being done. Yara possesses a lot of ammonia plants. At this current point in time, retrofitting is a significantly lower 
lower cost than greenfields projects. And so that's the advantage we're trying to capture. But I think also um, you need to keep in mind the very success of these brownfields projects will generate IP, will generate technical learnings, technological and cost improvements in the next few years. And the catalyzing, importantly, of renewable hydrogen and ammonia markets means that, in effect, this old way of doing things will be overtaken. Because whilst we're, this is where we are now, all the lessons we learn in the next two to three to four years will eventually help us design and build new renewables-based hydrogen and ammonia plants cheaper than retrofitting, so we know the path we're on. I guess, uh, for me, going back to uni days, it's a classic example of the creative destruction of capitalism with green tinges. I'm very positive. So, Almost finally, uh, the last point, one that I think can be easily forgotten. The first slide showed one conception of the Pilbara as an empty landscape that presents vast economic opportunities, but there's a very different conception of the region, as you see above, that, show, that knows and values every part of the region. And this belief system needs to be considered at the front end if we want to realise the timelines I've been talking about for development. It's not something you can get to a certain point, say, to take a fit, and then you start to consider how you'll manage these issues. Um, so I do note, even before Duke and Gorge, the investor community was increasingly focusing on social risk with concepts such as the Sustainable Development Goals, the Equator Principles, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, the International Labour Organisation's Indigenous and Tribal Peoples Convention, which has been ratified by many countries, including Norway, which basically set a framework of, and structures around how you operate in an Indigenous um, environment. So I'd suggest that as operators, we're certainly seeking and pursuing our green accreditation and certification, but we also need to follow uh, some of the guidelines around our free, prior and informed consent accreditation or will continue to face challenges. So the bottom line is the large-scale development of renewables in the 21st century uh, needs to come at it with a 21st century mindset in order to build the platform we need. It's not a warning or a negative aspect, it's just an observation that in order to pursue aggressive timelines in construction and development, we need this strong foundation of trust well in advance so that we can maintain that throughout and move forward. Um, I won't talk longer, um, but this is just something out of Yara, and the key point I just wanted to emphasise is the global aspect of what we're doing. Um, and as they, they pointed out here in the last slide, it's a growth opportunity. This is an enormous opportunity for Western Australia and Australia. Uh, it's no surprise that you've got a lot of ex-oil and gas people here driving energy transitions, and I think the importance of what we can do shouldn't be understated. And as I've mentioned, there's plenty more work to do, so we'll uh, do everything we can to step up and deliver. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Luke, for that um, really insightful uh, presentation. I mean, I guess from a state government perspective, what really excites us about this project is its existing infrastructure, where we're already producing hydrogen, already exporting ammonia, and it's really about making it a greener product, which I, as Luke was saying, you know, I think going forward, shareholders, customers will, will kind of demand that. And I guess the real positive is it actually broadens your market. So there are lots of opportunities and it should be seen in, in that light. So great presentation. Uh, our next presenter is Robert Grant, and he'll be talking around the hydrogen future perspectives from uh, Fortescue. And this should be a particularly interesting session given uh, his chairman's recent comments around all things hydrogen. So we welcome this uh, presentation from Robert. Thank you. Welcome everybody and thank you for the kind of introduction. My name is uh, Rob Grant and I'm the Director of Energy at Fortescue. I've been with the business since April last year, but actually started my career um, in renewable energy just over 25 years ago up at Lake Argyle, which at the time with the Oort Hydro project was uh, Western Australia's largest renewable project. And I hope that I can finish my career here in Western Australia working with Fortescue, building what will be hopefully another NEM size asset, I think, as we uh, take advantage of this amazing opportunity that we have in Western Australia for renewable energy and uh, the green hydrogen economy. Uh, today I'm just going to give you a bit of an intro to or summary of what uh, Fortescue does and is, uh, a little around our hydrogen strategy and how that's linked to our decarbonisation targets and why we think that's going to be a great export opportunity that uh, Fortescue and Western Australia can leverage from. So this 
says that everything I say you can't rely on. And uh, very importantly to Fortescue, our values are something which, uh, having come from a similar sort of business in Pacific Hydro uh, uh, through most of my career so far, I know that culture drives success over strategy most of the time. Uh, and in Fortescue's case, to stand up a business that is less than 20 years old from a blank sheet of paper in the way that Andrew Forrest did uh, and turn it into a $60 billion market capitalisation organisation is, is predominantly based on culture and values. And this is what underlies everything we do at Fortescue. As I say, uh, market capitalisation around $60 billion. We are the fourth, world's fourth largest producer of iron ore. We produce around 188 million tonnes uh, last year of iron ore uh, export from the operations up in the Pilbara. Uh, we have a fully integrated pit to port infrastructure system and um, again having not come out of the resources sector uh, and seeing what this business and our competitors and colleagues do every day in the Pilbara through the iron ore export industry, it is no surprise that it has been able to hold up the Australian economy uh, both in employment and economic terms through this through this downturn, downturn of, uh, caused by COVID. It is, it is a very, very significant infrastructure project going on every single day up there. Uh, and it's something that uh, I certainly didn't really co fully comprehend until I saw for the first time after joining last year. But um, we want to be able to leverage uh, from those operations that those scale and comparative advantages that we have in iron ore production and have made us so successful over the last 20 years in the same way in green hydrogen. We're just leveraging the same comparative advantages of scale and high resource intensity, just in a different way. Um, you know, our chairman feels very strongly about the need for decarbonisation, but that wouldn't be possible, wouldn't be as easily possible if our main operations was in the northwest of Canada. Uh, you know, we just have this amazing solar resource intensity and moving west very significant wind resource intensity that we're going to apply in the same way, which gives you some sense of how an iron ore business, a resources business, can become an energy business. So um, last year we set ourselves the target to be net zero carbon emissions by 2040. So that is industry leading. The Paris uh, commitments that are linked to the um, temperature targets uh, have us you know, at 1.5 degrees by 2050, so everybody links their, target, their net zero targets to 2050. But in actual fact, I think if we wait that long, we won't. We'll, we'll, we'll blow right past that number. And so um, and our chairman has set us a target publicly of being 2040 net zero and diesel free by 2030. Um, that is a very scary and challenging target to meet, particularly given you know, what we do to produce this iron ore. Uh, we have a station energy fleet, a couple of hundred megawatts, uh, that has to be transitioned from uh, diesel to gas to renewables. Uh, and we have a mobile fleet, the haul trucks and the associated mining equipment that burns around 600 million litres of diesel a year. And that is uh, the reason why we produce around two to two and a half million tonnes of CO2. So um, it is a very significant target to meet and it's by forcing us to have a much shorter line of sight to being decarbonised that we believe is not only you know, an enormous challenge but a huge opportunity because if we can do that, continue to create shareholder value, increase shareholder value, uh, it'll give us a competitive advantage as the world is kind of catching up with their 2050 aspirations. We don't want people to wait till 2050, but we want to be ahead of everybody uh, as they are coming to the same realisation that Andrew has, uh, has outlined in his recent Boyer lecture to, um, uh, to the world a couple of months ago. So look, we're already, uh, even before I arrived, we were, we were doing many things in the space. We were learning by doing. Uh, initially, we had invested through an offtake agreement with Alinta for the 60 megawatt Chichester solar farm. So that will take all of our diesel generation at the Chichester hub uh, off, uh, uh, off diesel and onto a gas, uh, gas solar battery hybrid system. Um, we had started the 
construction of the Pilbara Energy Connect, which is the integration uh, of all of our transmission, all, all of our um, gen, all of our operational assets through a transmission network, um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute, and uh, and also the uh, investment in our own 150 megawatt solar farm that will be predominantly used to provide energy for the new Ironbridge project, uh, alongside about a probably around a 50 megawatt battery energy storage system. Uh, on the hydrogen side, we've made some investments already, sort of again learning by doing. At Jandicott, we have a partnership with ECHO that's a 625 megawatt, 625 um, kilowatt electrolyzer that is uh, using uh, solar energy down there at Jandicott's, at ECHO's facility to produce hydrogen, green hydrogen for the Toyota Mirai fleet that's uh, running around Perth now. Uh, and we've also invested in 10 highs on hydrogen fuel cell coaches which will be used to transport um, staff around up at Christmas Creek operations in the Pilbara. And that will be a one and a half megawatt uh, electrolyzer. That will be the largest in Australia when it's, uh, when it's installed. So we've still got, um, you know, we're making small but very significant uh, steps. And I'll talk a bit more about how we step up in orders of magnitude in, in a minute. Uh, and also a very successful partnership with CSIRO. So, um, as you know, the previous speakers were saying, a lot of what we need to do to make this transition successful is around technology development and scientific breakthrough. So having that partnership with, with CSIRO on things like the metal membrane technology that can help strip off, that strips off the nitrogen uh, from ammonia as a carrier at the customer end. So if you're in, in Japan and you're receiving ammonia on a ship, uh, you put it through the metal membrane technology and it uh, strips off the nitrogen to give you a, a fuel. Uh, for use in transportation. So just on a, uh, from a visual point of view, that's uh, operations and uh, hubs in the Pilbara. The, the, the decarbonisation challenge does fall into those two buckets of emissions I talked about before, you know, one being stationary energy. So we have to, first of all, join up uh, operations into an integrated transmission network. We have to extend that network. Uh, and then we have to start to install a uh, much higher level of uh, renewables penetration. And we think that you know, moving out to the west will give us the ability to uh, both harness you know, very good wind resources you know, far enough from the coast not to be affected by a cyclone, but, uh, and, uh, but, but, but close enough to be able to extract what is going to be very good diurnal uh, supply, both day and night, for wind and solar. And about a gigawatt, I think, is what will end up out of that location to supply all of the energy leads, along with storage and hydrogen production for, uh, for the network. And uh, the other bucket of emissions that has to be offset is the transportation. And at this stage, we don't have a clear idea on whether we will be going fully hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in the haul fleet or batteries. But uh, the, the work is underway at the moment to determine that. But either way, we're going to need a significant amount of renewable energy either to be charging the batteries or to be uh, making the hydrogen for the fuel cells, you know, similar to what we're doing with the, uh, the, co the bus fleet that's um, being deployed at the moment. Uh, there hasn't been large-scale deployment of hydrogen fuel cells in the Pilbara, so it is hot, it's dusty, uh, and we need to see these, these coaches in operation before that's part of the decision-making process that we're, we're getting ready for now. So on the back of that is, you know, Fortescue as a customer for a lot of green hydrogen. We sort of realised or understood that that offers an enormous opportunity because if we can do that, uh, add shareholder value because in decarbonising and saving on fuel costs, we're um, adding incremental value, then our, sh then our competitors will need it and many of our customers downstream of iron ore will also need it. You just need to bear in mind that in steel production, you know, only about 10% of the emissions that come from steel is actually out of the mining process. So our 2 million tonnes uh, of CO2 gets multiplied significantly once it goes up to the blast furnaces in uh, China and, uh, and North Asia. So helping them decarbonise and giving them the products they need at the cheapest price is uh, an enormous opportunity, which is why Fortescue Future Industries was stood up. Um, and it is at the moment uh, going around the world looking for similar opportunities to the Pilbara where substantial scale and comparative advantage locations for renewables exist but may not traditionally have been connected to a um, power grid system, you know, a bit like the Pilbara. It's, that opportunity has always been there, just hasn't been the demand. So um, initially that's what Fortescue Future Industries has been doing. And, um, you know, we believe that 
we can be successful in this venture and be, uh, become a great energy company alongside a great resources company because we've done it before. Again, from a blank sheet of paper, uh, the same sorts of infrastructure requirements, the same sorts of management expertise, and the same sorts of deployment and partnering in, in technology will, re will be required to stand this venture up as it was to stand up uh, the concept of building a new iron ore producer in the Pilbara uh, in, uh, in, in those days back in the early 2000s. And I guess, uh, you know, just uh, acknowledge we are in a, a, fuel, a fossil fuels conference and we don't have that legacy, you know, we don't have that legacy asset base to, uh, to, to protect. I guess we come at this with a, a pretty clean sheet and uh, we are able to um, build on our ability to find and sell wholesale resource products to, to customers, particularly in North Asia, who are going to have this uh, very significant and increasing demand. So the most um, exciting and first cab off the rank will be uh, in Tasmania. So you say, well, why aren't we doing Pilbara first? Obviously, we're doing what we can in the, in the decarbonisation space. But the early days of the green hydrogen industry uh, is challenging economically because the cost of electrolysers is still at a level where, let's say, solar panels were uh, 12, 15 years ago. We knew solar panels existed. You could put them on top of a car and drive from Adelaide, from Darwin to Adelaide but they weren't that really uh, economically viable to stick on your roof. Here we are today, uh, and they're ubiquitous, and the um, unit cost of solar production is, is lower than fossil fuels. And that was through a lot of in intervention and support for the industry as we went through that uh, transition phase. So to be able to do the same with electrolysis uh, and, and water electrolysis manufacturing and economies of scale, we're going to need the first few projects to be probably buying quite expensive electrolysers. Uh, and in doing that, we need to be able to leverage all the, uh, to make the economic sort of the project work, we need to be able to leverage as much existing infrastructure as possible, as much sunk cost in renewables as possible. Uh, and Tasmania offers that opportunity. It has a very large hydro installed base that's all uh, quite old and full, you know, fully depreciated. Uh, and it has a very good existing port facilities at uh, Bell Bay. So that project is around 250 megawatts of electrolysis. Uh, it will be by far the largest uh, in Australia and probably globally. It will produce about 250,000 tonnes of green ammonia and we are working on approvals um, and the uh, early contractor involvement phase at the moment, uh, aiming to have um, some early orders middle of the year and full FID by the end of, uh, end of this year. So I think just to, to close out, um, you know, we, don't, we don't do this alone, we didn't stand up uh, Fortescue Iron Ore as a standalone, you know, although Andrew is a visionary leader, uh, he didn't do it all by himself and as he always says, you know, he only achieves what he does by standing on the, the shoulders of giants. We need to do the same here. There are many people in the uh, industry already who have far greater knowledge and understanding of what we are trying to achieve. We're just following this vision. Uh, to be carbon neutral by 2040, to stand up a great export industry for Western Australia and Australia generally. Uh, and already through what we've achieved, we've done that through partnership and collaboration uh, with government uh, <clears throat> and, with, uh, and with many partners across, uh, across the value chain. And we very much look forward to doing the same as we uh, continue this journey with Fortescue Future Industries and in 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 the projects uh, in the Pilbara uh, and across Australia generally. Thank you very much. Can I firstly thank Rob, and if you're wondering what's going on and why he might have looked a little confused when he got up, um, I've had a, quite a simple task today to just um, present the presenters, and I've managed to start out presenting one and, and ask uh, another presenter up to the stage, so I do apologise for that. But it was a very good presentation, and I've just brought it forward one. I guess um, from the state's perspective, the work that FMG are doing is, is very exciting. As Robert said, you know, they're a company that have stood up a, a major iron ore producer and, and doing the same in green hydrogen has some kind of similarities. So we, we hope to see that same success story repeated. So to get back on schedule, um, can I welcome James Miller-Randall? So sorry, James. And James is going to talk about entering the hydrogen era 
and uh, James is the Director of Strategy and New Business at Pacific Hydro, who are doing some exciting work in WA. So welcome, James, and, and apologies again. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, look, I, I thought I would start uh, by talking a little bit about who Pacific Hydro is. Um, Rob will know this very well, given his uh, background, but some of you may not. So uh, we are an owner, uh, developer and operator of renewable electricity assets across Australia and also a retailer of electricity and gas. So we've been around almost 30 years and have over 650 megawatts of uh, operating assets in the system and another 1.3 gigawatts in the development pipeline. Um, as you can see from this slide, uh, we have assets dotted across Australia, but importantly for, for today, we have a, a very important asset that we're very excited about, which is in the Ord, uh, which is a, a, hyd a hydro facility that I'll talk a little bit more about shortly. So today I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about hydrogen and its applications. I know a number of speakers have beaten me to the punch, so I won't spend too much time on that, um, but it is a really exciting opportunity um, for Australia. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit about what we're thinking in terms of uh, hydrogen in the Ord as the first step in our long-term hydrogen strategy for Pacific Hydro. I'll talk a little bit about why we've chosen the Ord and then the uh, feasibility study that we've just wrapped up, a little bit about community engagement and where we're heading. So not to dwell on the topic for too long, um, but hydrogen is, uh, you know, is a fantastic uh, energy source. It is the most abundant resource in the universe and uh, we deal with it every day in, in, the, in, the, in the form of water. Um, it has applications across uh, any number of end-use markets, which is, I think, what makes it one of the most exciting opportunities uh, you know, in the energy sector. Everything from uh, you know, powering passenger vehicles all the way through to heavy transport and shipping. It's a chemical feedstock for a number of uh, industrial goods. It can be used for heat. And I think, importantly, it's also a, a really practical energy storage source, both for firming uh, uh, intermittent renewables, but also just as a way of um, storing energy that can be quite difficult with our other technologies. I think one of the other things that's so exciting about hydrogen is the export potential and this is what makes it such a fantastic opportunity for Australia. So we have a number of uh, very um, kind of energy scarce neighbours to our north, uh, most notably Japan, South Korea and Singapore, which presents a huge export opportunity for Australia and something that we're very excited about at Pacific Hydro. So what uh, makes Australia such a fantastic place to, to be thinking about green hydrogen? Uh, well, the first thing is the, the, the incredible resource base that we have in this country. Um, we have incredible resource uh, in terms of wind and solar for the electricity production required for uh, hydrogen production. Uh, we also have incredible water resources both inland and then also we're surrounded by water. Um, the other thing that's fantastic is our infrastructure. So we have an established export industry for, uh, for gas um, so we have ports dotted across the country and, and many across um, the coast of Western Australia. And we have an established uh, road infrastructure as well to enable us to transport uh, hydrogen and hydrogen byproducts uh, via road. And as I mentioned, we have this, this amazing proximity to export markets as well. So when I think about that in the context of Western Australia, well, Western Australia ticks all of those boxes. So I think Rob's talked about the incredible wind resource that we have, the incredible solar resource that we have, and the existing infrastructure that's in place, um, a lot of land uh, to, to um, continue to develop further renewable energy to power hydrogen production, and also a number of offtake industries as well. So ammonia uh, for fertiliser production, uh, mining as well as potential fuel for some of the, the stationary fleet and some of the uh, mobile fleet as well that Rob mentioned. So a huge opportunity facing us in Australia, something that we're very excited about uh, and something that we're now leaning into as Pacific Hydro. 
So the first cab off the rank for us in terms of our long-term uh, hydrogen strategy at Pacific Hydro is in our Ord hydrogen Ord hydro plant in the East Kimberley, uh, something Rob again would know very uh, a lot about. Um, it's a 30 megawatt hydro power plant uh, in Lake Argyle. It was established in 1996, so it is uh, it's been around a long time, uh, which gives us the benefit of having a very low cost source of energy for input into hydrogen. It currently supplies the local community and also the Argyle Diamond Mine, which is progressively winding down its operations over the coming years, which is going to free up capacity uh, to deploy that energy into other uses. And so uh, in terms of our kind of hydrogen strategy, it was a, an obvious first candidate for us to uh, develop our next project. So why do we like the Ord? Uh, well, the first thing is it ticks all of those boxes that I mentioned that are prerequisites to the production of hydrogen. So we have access to a, a, a significant land mass around our existing facility. Um, that gives us the ability to site a hydrogen facility, but also gives us the ability to expand upon the existing uh, generation source that we have in the Ord Hydro to give us a roadmap to expand beyond just powering via hydro and into both solar and wind power. We do have this spare capacity um, that will come online over the next couple of years, which gives us a source of very low cost energy for the production of green hydrogen. And the great thing about that resource is the very high capacity factor. So it gives us a, a very stable, uh, very reliable source of energy for the production of hydrogen, which is fantastic from an economic standpoint. And then finally, it's uh, really quite well located in terms of both export uh, ports. Um, so it's quite close to the port of Wyndham and um, via a relatively short trip by road to the port of Darwin. So it gives us incredible access to export markets. Um, there is a major transport that route that runs nearby as well, and so there is a potential for the hydrogen to be used to power road transport as well with a fueling station uh, along that route. Um, the other thing that's made this project is really attractive is also the support of the WA government through the uh, Renewable Hydrogen Fund. So we were successful in securing some funding to support the feasibility assessment that I'll talk a little bit about, which has enabled us to get a high level of confidence around this project and we're uh, um, very thankful for the WA government for their support in that regard. So as I mentioned, we've just uh, completed a feasibility study. Uh, that was largely around looking at the technical feasibility of developing a hydrogen or hydrogen and ammonia facility at the Ord uh, hydro plant. The study looked at a number of factors, uh, including the, the technical feasibility of uh, generating hydrogen or producing hydrogen and ammonia at the Ord. It helped us work through the technology options we had for that and narrow down to a preferred set of technologies that gave us the most cost-effective uh, mechanism for producing hydrogen at that site. Um, we also uh, were able to complete a, a layout design and optimise that design for, um, for the production of both hydrogen or hydrogen and ammonia to ensure that we were using land most efficiently. Um, the study also gave us some really fantastic insight around supply chain, both in terms of getting equipment to site, uh, but then also getting uh, produced hydrogen or ammonia out to end use markets. Uh, so we have a high level of confidence now, both around our ability to get equipment to site, but also our ability to then get export, um, both to domestic markets and international markets. Uh, the study also uh, involved looking at um, water. So water is obviously a really important part of um, hydro green hydrogen production. Um, and so we did quite a bit of work looking at where we would source water, how we would manage water usage, and how we would uh, manage any waste requirements. And then importantly, obviously, is then what this was all going to cost. So we've now been able to get a higher level of confidence around both the capital cost and our ongoing operational costs. All of this will be um, made available in a knowledge sharing report that uh, should be released to the public in the, in the coming um, period of time. So uh, look out for that in the not too distant future. 
I guess to, to kind of sum up where we landed off the back of this feasibility report though is that we now have a much, much higher level of confidence about uh, the, the technical feasibility of um, pushing ahead with this project, uh, the, um, the, the technology choice that we're going to make in terms of uh, how we will produce hydrogen, uh, hydrogen and ammonia at the site and then also the pathway to getting the end product to, uh, to customers. Throughout the process, uh, community engagement was a really important part of what we did, and uh, this work was all occurring last year, so um, made community engagement somewhat challenging for us, um, but we were able to undertake some early engagement um, with key stakeholders on a virtual basis, which is um, no easy feat. Um, that has meant that, that in this year, towards the middle of the year and beyond, uh, we hope to be able to continue that engagement uh, at a much more face-to-face -face level, uh, which is going to be a really important part of bringing this project um, further along. So, um, what are the next steps for us? Uh, well, the key thing is really about firming up the offtake now. So um, in approaching the feasibility study, we've had some fantastic discussions with potential offtakers. We need to move those discussions forward to a much more mature level. And then we're also looking for an equity partner or partners to um, push ahead with the development of this project. Um, we are targeting uh, mid-23 uh, notice to proceed. Um, which would get us operating towards uh, the end of that time frame or early into 2024. Uh, we uh, expect to um, commence planning studies uh, in the next uh, quarter and those will run through until the middle of 2022. So to wrap up, um, we are really excited about the prospects for the Ord Hydrogen Project as the first step in Pacific Hydro's long-term hydrogen strategy. We're very uh, pleased that we are taking this first step in WA. And again, we're very thankful to the WA government and the support of JETSI in helping us get to this point. So with that, I want to wrap up and say thank you for uh, the opportunity to come and speak. And I'd welcome uh, anyone that has an interest in the project to come and have a chat. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, James. And just your final uh, point there about happy to take questions reminds me that I should have said at the start that I think the majority of our speakers will be available at the NERA stand at the end of um, today's session. So please come along if you've got some questions. Our final speaker today, I'm sure we're well known to a lot of you, if not all of you, um, Miranda Taylor. So Miranda's going to talk about um, hydrogen clusters supporting manufacturing technologies for a clean energy future. Amanda is the CEO of NERA, which is an organisation that we've increasingly worked really closely with over the last few years, and they're doing some, some great initiatives, and I guess that's been echoed today by a couple of our speakers when they've referenced the regional hydrogen tech clusters, which uh, is a great initiative. So I'd love to wel like to welcome uh, Miranda to the stage. Thank you. Um, so I think the, the saying goes that now for something completely different. Um, I'm not here to talk about uh, an individual project, but I think um, I thank all the speakers so far because it's really set the scene for what is such an exciting opportunity um, for Australia and Western Australia. Um, and I would start by saying that in this world, as we emerge out of COVID, there's two truths that have absolutely emerged. And one is the need for diversification, and the second is for resilience. Um, I also think a third one is the growing strength of the regions and all the projects that you have described this morning uh, underscore just how um, much the regions are playing a role in our future. So NERA, um, we are working with our energy sector partners to improve Australia's performance, um, both in the productivity of the energy sector itself, but also importantly in the commercialization of those technologies that were mentioned in every presentation so far. And part of, this, part of the challenge for us with the hydrogen story is that we've got huge advantages, but we've also got competitors. So we can't wait 
to work on one bit of the story um, of the development of the hydrogen economy or the hydrogen industry. We, ha we have to be working on all pieces at the same time if we're going to be ahead of the pack um, and indeed uh, lead the world in the hydrogen development. So I think the, the issue is around can Australia not just export molecules but also export the technologies, the know-how, the capabilities. And I think that was a, a key theme of the, the presentation so far as well. So NERA is um, working on four or five key areas. One of them is the hydrogen supply chain. The other one is the fact that the digitization uh, smart technology world is going to be fundamental to the energy future and renewables and the whole move to renewables will need to be enabled by smart digital technology um, and regenerating supply chains and yesterday we launched the CODA, the decommissioning centre of excellence uh, and we believe that all of these things actually work very nicely together um, as we go through the energy transition and move uh, from gas to things like hydrogen. So hydrogen, as everyone has said, is a key opportunity for Australia. It is, it is I would underscore one, that we still need to keep in mind uh, that diversification principle, that we want to build in resilience into our energy, in, into our energy future. I also think it's highlighting the fact that the world of old when we were operating in industry silos where you had mining and you had oil and gas and you had energy uh, companies and you had uh, manufacturing companies, that, those silos are breaking down, which is a really good thing. Um, as Fortescue said, they could emerge as an energy player um, and indeed um, I think we'll see that, that crossing transfer of knowledge and capability uh, growing. So we have uh, the policy support, that's very clear, both across Australia but also from our international trading partners. We also have the fact that there are strong signals all around the world for the decarbonisation journey. Um, and we heard one overnight from Europe um, around uh, taxes for uh, scope two, scope three carbon into Europe. This is going to be a growing trend. Um, Australia has many competitive advantages which have already been covered. Um, but we've also got global competitors, so we need to move and we need to move together. And I repeat the comment I made yesterday, is that we can't do it alone. We cannot retreat into uh, thinking that one company or one group can t solve the challenge that we've got alone. We actually have to do this together. We have to collaborate. It's too big a thing to do on our own. And that would just bring me to one thing I would like to emphasize. When NERA opened our doors five years ago, we had a good look at our colleagues in Norway, and best of the last, and I was saying yesterday, that we were greatly inspired by the Norwegian model of clustering. Um, clustering is not a word that is uh, used greatly in Australia, but Norway does it so well. So when we first opened our doors, we looked for the opportunity to um, develop a, a technology cluster around subsea technologies. So there is a, a subsea technology cluster based out of Perth that was formed on the basis of the Norwegian model. Um, and they are growing in success. Um, and interestingly, I saw a project out of the UK where the subsea technology uh, community and the ocean wave um, technology world are actually working on some joint projects about wave energy with subsea technology projects. So this is what I mean about breaking down all these silos. Um, but Australia is targeting hydrogen under $2. Um, so all of the projects that you've heard about are talking about how we're going to have to, what the journey that we're going to have to go on um, in order that we can get to producing hydrogen under $2, and part of that is the scaling of the technology sector. Part of it is also how we operate and maintain the hydrogen production projects once they're up and going, because a lot of costs come in that phase. Um, but at least a strong part of it is the technologies, and that is where NERA's focus has been. So we are focused on uh, 
bringing together all of the technologies that are emerging to support the hydrogen market. And while, the, while we haven't quite landed, as, as I think FMG said, on what some of the uses might be, whether it's in, in, in transport or where, nevertheless, we, we need to work on the technologies and scaling and bringing them together. So what a cluster does is it brings together like-minded technology SMEs. Often they are geographically located, but in some cases it can, they can be virtual clusters. Um, but they come together in a, in a unique business model where they can work on common problems, they can even combine their offerings, um, and they can work to give greater visibility to the capabilities that we have. So for one small business to work on a, a technology challenge and partner with a CSRO or another organization might be really difficult and too costly. But through a cluster, they can actually work on some common issues. So they're very, very powerful. And it's a very good way of enabling customers to be able to more easily access and see the technologies because they're, they're grouped. They do increase productivity and they make for more rapid innovation and transfer of knowledge. It's really a new business model um, for how we go about developing technologies in this country. So this is the journey that we've been on since 2016 to develop the hydrogen economy. Um, really, from, from the launch of the National Hydrogen Strategy, uh, we talked with the federal government at that point about the fact that there was nothing in the strategy that focused on the supply chain. And I don't mean the supply chain for the hydrogen molecule, I mean the supply chain for the technologies. So we were inserted into the national strategy at the last minute and tasked to look at a model for, for developing technology clusters around Australia. And I want to just clarify that there is a difference between the word hub and cluster. Um, there is in the national strategy uh, a piece of work around the geographic hubs and they are really focused on uh, where you've got um, emergence of things like all the infrastructure, the export infrastructure, energy systems, workforces, research organizations and a whole lot of other enabling factors that you need to support the domestic and, and export uh, market for hydrogen. Um, and what we found is that the clusters, which are the technologies, obviously are starting to emerge around those hubs, but they themselves are not the, ge they're not the geographic hubs, they're groups of technologies. Um, so we initially started by trying to create one national cluster, and it became increasingly obvious to us that we, we needed to take a bottom-up up approach and allow the technologies to naturally group by themselves and to form where they most logically belonged and into a community. And it really is almost a, it's a community of technology practitioners. Um, so we actually did an EOI. We did a series of workshops around the country just before COVID-19 last year, leading into AOG uh, 2020. And out of that series of workshops, um, the clusters went off, all the technology companies went off and naturally grouped into clusters. We then did an EOR, EOI and they self-identified and we applied some criteria around the, which ones were likely to um, had financial support from their states because the state's role in this and the region's role in this is very, very important. So we worked with each of the states and the regions about which ones were the strongest proposition for them. Um, and we, out, of, out of that EOI, we selected 13 clusters around the country with four in Western Australia and one in the Northern Territory. Um, and we would add that it's quite likely that other regional clusters will emerge. And some of the clusters that have been announced so far may find that they have got something in common with others and they merge, or some may indeed disappear. So we do see this as an adaptive process, not a, not a fixed in stone. So I know that there were a couple of areas that were disappointed that they didn't get the early funding, but we will continue to work with them to uh, see if there's some other clusters that might emerge and join the network. Our, our goal is to bring the clusters together into one super cluster, if you like, if you want to call it that. Um, and I know Canada has a, a super cluster program. So we want to make sure that the learnings um, 
we can take the best from each cluster and actually share it across them in terms of how they develop their business model. So over the next 18 months, we will be working very closely with each of the clusters um, to actually develop their business proposition, their market analysis, uh, what their early projects might be, and we'll be looking to find some commonality across all, the, all of the clusters and share um, maybe some common tools, some common methodologies around things like that market analysis so that they can move faster um, on their journey. Um, and we really want to form them into this national cluster so that the, our international trading partners can more easily see um, through coming to this national cluster where our technology capabilities are and see them linked to the hubs. So they have put Australia on the map already. So when we launched the cluster initiative, we were approached by the world's media. And so the news of Australia's cluster strategy went on to the BBC World Service. It went through Reuters. Um, it went through a number of international media chains as well as local. So in addition to, you know, there's, I think there's no doubt that the world is looking at what, what Australia is doing. Um, and the clusters are a, a key part of that. Oops. Um, so this is just a quick overview of where we've got to to date. We've got 13 technology clusters, eight states and territories, with uh, contributory funding from those states and territories, including from the WA government. There are 300 organizations participating in the clusters. Um, and there is uh, getting up towards $2 million uh, that have been invested in seed funding to get the clusters up and running. Um, we actually had 58 applications and we're sitting on a database, enormous database from those 58 applications. Um, and we are actually doing uh, an economic analysis of all the ABNs and the, and the technology companies. So we are going to be able to share some insights into the technology capabilities around Australia once we've done that analysis. Um, the, the, the key themes and focus areas that, have, that are coming out of the clusters are obviously renewable hydrogen, and it's about activating the supply chains, and it's about developing technology. It's also about the circular economy, which is a growing theme of the renewable economy, is how can we build in uh, a circular economy? And it is about building the skills and capability as we go on the journey. Um, and it's also about standards and certification, which the federal government are leading. And NERA was invited to uh, nominate onto the standards committee. And FM, it's an FMG um, person is, is the chair of that hydrogen standards committee doing some important work. Because the standards and the regulatory framework are obviously going to be critical to social license as well as, um, as, well as the regional uh, and Aboriginal um, participation. We really need to take the public on this hydrogen journey with us um, so that we make sure we've got the social license as we go. Um, transportation and agricultural applications as well as manufacturing applications are three of the themes that are coming out of the clusters. So they're accelerating the development of the local hydrogen industry and, lever and will leverage the collective strength of a national network, which I think is fantastic. Um, too often we're seen to compete state by state. But what we're showing is that there is capability in every state and territory in Australia um, and everybody is working together on this and we are marketing Team Australia to the world. Um, this, is not, this, is not a, uh, this is a competitive but collaborative space. So the three um, or four clusters in Western Australia are the Karratha Tech Cluster, the Peel and South West Metro Tech Cluster and the West Australian Technology Cluster for Hydrogen. Um, and there are representatives uh, here today from all of the clusters and you've already heard that uh, two of them so I urge you to come to the NERA stand and maybe talk to them if you're interested in, in finding out more. So we want to build, we want to collaborate and we want to grow. That's our goal for the clusters. We want to drive collaboration across the clusters um, and we want to grow them into a network 
and we want to grow their international relations, relations. So we've already, for instance, through the Blue Economy CRC, got links to the Norwegian ocean energy and the hydrogen cluster. Um, so we're already forging international links through other clusters in other countries that are working in, other, in this space. Um, and just to give an example on how that can work in the middle, when COVID-19 um, uh, uh, broke out at the end of AOG last year, the subsea cluster was able to reach out to some of the other clusters working in the subsea technology space and where some of them had some work to do in other countries, they were actually able to share um, and mobilise resources from other countries because they couldn't get, get to those countries. So having this inter international network is really, really fundamental. So it's time. It is time now, and we have to get going because we do have competition around the world, but we have huge advantages. So it's time to support, invest, and get involved. So thank you very much, and I would invite everybody to come to the NERA uh, stand now if they want to talk with all of the speakers this morning in more detail about the hydrogen opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Miranda, for that. As, as always, very insightful and entertaining. And I think Nira, Nira are a really, really good example of um, you know, industry and government needing to work together, as Miranda was saying, if we're really going to capitalise on the opportunities that we have here in WA. And as Miranda makes it the point, not only WA, but the whole of Australia. So thanks very much for that presentation. Um, just in closing today, I guess there are a couple of uh, themes that stood out for me, um, and actually before I say that, I'd just like to make the point that the state government, through its kind of grant funding and its backing of renewable hydrogen, has been involved in all the projects I think that were discussed today. So, you know, our our wish is to see those projects really prosper and go on and become much bigger enterprises. So, and I think on, based on what we've heard today, they're all definitely moving in the right direction. So, well done. Um, in terms of just wrapping up, I think it's really obvious to everybody that WA has some comparative advantages in this space, uh, which is a great start, but it's not enough in itself. And um, you know, we re really do have to work hard to capitalise on, on those comparative advantages. I think we're lucky in that um, we are a proven energy supplier. We have a you know, really good track record and are well thought of in our markets and many of those markets match up really well so a lot of the LNG markets that we have are definitely going to be the hydrogen markets of the future so that's a good start as well. I think we're really lucky what we're increasingly seeing is that there are some great opportunities in decarbonising our resources sector which is world class and on a scale you know really matched by no one. So that's, that's a really great um, local market that where people can cut their teeth and I think FMG are a great example of that. There's obviously some really good technologies that have been growing in WA and commercialised which is really good to see and I guess is really the basis of work that NERA does and, and the various CRCs so that's really good to see that work in practice. Uh, clearly the cost of uh, green hydrogen is something that needs to be worked on and it needs to come down and it will over time and I guess that will come as a result of getting um, some production at scale which you know we're working with several projects which are looking to do that and hopefully that's not too far away. I guess the final comment would be the one that Miranda um, emphasised quite strongly and that is that we need to really work together, industry and government on this. So I guess I'd like to leave you with the kind of message today that uh, the, the state government through its various strategies, and I think there's also connections here with the renewable hydrogen, uh, sorry, the future battery strategy, um, and some of the work that the Hazer Group are doing links in well with that as well. So I think they were really very good presentations today, and I'd like to thank all our presenters. Uh, can I again just thank our forum partners, Woodside Energy, Chevron Australia, Jetsi, uh, Nira and Deloitte for their backing of today's event. Uh, just a reminder that it's free to download the uh, AOG Energy 2021 app, so I'd encourage you to do that and also use the hashtag. Uh, I think the next session in this room, for those who are interested, is, the, is one on supply forums, and that will be commencing in approximately 45 minutes. 
and again, just to repeat uh, Miranda's um, invitation that most of the speakers, I think, will be at the nearest stand and they'll be happy to take questions and I'm sure you'll all have a lot of those. So thank you very much again for attending today's session.